Well, how does Google know what features to add? Does it work with the users and right. ask them what uh, features they'd like to see, or do they j just say, well, we know what people need, we'll just add it? Well, yes, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, it's a little of all of the above. So, for example, one of the things that we'll do is in, in research, we'll see new pieces of technology, new capabilities come up, and we'll think, what can we do to use that? And then we'll figure out a way to get that in. And that's a technology-driven impetus. Another one will be, in my research or other, research, other researchers at Google, will discover needs that people have or latent, you know, implicit requirements that they can't even articulate. So, for example, one of the best stories there was nobody, when we launched Google years ago, said, oh, we need spell correction. Well, we launched spell correction, and it turned out to be massively successful. I don't know about you, but I often use Google to do spell correction for words I can't quite figure out. And it turns out that that has helped search, the property of search, the quality of search, more than almost anything else. But nobody articulated that. We had to see it in the misspellings we were getting in the search queries. Now, very often if you're entering a query and you mistype something, right. it'll say, well, we think you really meant this right. because that's right. We haven't seen a query like the one you entered, but if we change one letter, that's a really common query. Right. So is this what you really meant? That's right. So that's what I mean by spell correction. And that works in, in multiple ways, but it, it almost always gives you the right one. And one of the things about learning how to be a better searcher is that it's important in some cases to know how to overcome that, how to turn it off. So in that case, if you're looking for, say, uh, a family name that has a funny unusual variant spelling, you'd put double quotes around it. So double quote, word, double quote. And that tells Google, don't try to spell correct this. Give me exactly this word, this spelling, nothing else. So it won't try to help you out in a way that, right. in this and case, isn't helpful. And if you enter two words like a first name and a last name without the quotes, it might find an example of either name in the document but not connected. Correct. That's right. Whereas if it's in quote, the two words have to appear together. That's right. So that's a phrase search. So if you're looking for, say, Daniel M. Russell Google, you would say double quote, Daniel M. Russell, double quote. And that's a phrase search. So it will look for those terms in that sequence. Do you think Google actually affects the way people think? The fact that you're mm -hmm. using this tool so much actually changes the way the individual absorbs and processes information? I, I think more important is that every tool we build changes the way we think. So, for example, you and I both wear glasses. I don't know about you, but you know, 200 years ago, pre-glasses, I wouldn't have my job now. I couldn't be a scribe. I couldn't be a literate person because I couldn't see what to do. So the technology of glasses has changed my ability to be a scholar, and probably yours too. So I think every kind of information technology fundamentally changes to some degree the way we think. Does it change us neurologically? Probably not. We still have, you know, the visual parts of our brain. We still have the uh, auditory parts of our brain, the, the motor neurons. That's all kind of the same stuff. But it's important to remember that even Plato thought that technology of writing was a bad idea, and that's 2,000 years ago. Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. Didn't he write a bunch of stuff? He did write a bunch of stuff, but his teacher was Socrates, who was illiterate. Did you know that? He I actually couldn't read or write. It was up to his student, Plato, to actually write this. And in, in the book Phaedrus, he writes that the technology of writing is only an aid to reminiscence and not actual intelligence. I guess a lot of technologies were ridiculed at first, and then they became really useful. And then they become standard, right. Yeah. right. So when books were first introduced, for example, uh, there were two interesting problems, one of which was that students could read their own books. They didn't need the lecturer, because the lecturer means to read aloud, right? And so it was taking away the power of the instructor, the power of the lecturer to interpret that knowledge. The second thing that happened was people were suddenly flooded with books because the cost of that technology drove the cost of the books down to a point where you could actually cut them up and paste them into a document. And it wasn't until the Gutenberg printing press revolution that the cost of printed text became low enough you could actually cut and paste. And that's where it started. Now, speaking of massive information, this brings up another interesting topic because you're the creator of a MOOC. That's right. And a MOOC, M-O-O-C, that's an acronym for Massive mm -hmm. Open Online Class. So you've right. created a MOOC which attracted 150,000 students online. Well, that was the first one. That was the first one. We actually ran it again recently, mm -hmm. and we had 127,000 sign up for the second class. 
Well, that's still pretty impressive. It's over a quarter million, so it's not right. bad, right? Right. So the question is, how does that work? Is that does mm -hmm. that incorporate some different technology? I mean, how right. how does that make it easy for people to? Uh, and the, the subject of your MOOC is power searching yes. with Google. That's right. Well, you kind of knew that was going to happen. Uh, the beginning of it was basically starting with the observation that I was seeing people not being able to search effectively. And I thought, what can I do to help? And so I went around and I was teaching courses all around, teaching librarians and teaching teachers and so on. And we put together the MOOC, which is really a kind of sequence of very small lessons. And this is key. The lessons are short video segments, five to say 10 minutes in length. Not too intimidating. Not too intimidating, that's right. I, I try to keep my, uh, my ideas very straightforward so I can communicate them. I do a lot of demonstration. And then we have, so we have a short video and then we have a small assessment. So did you actually pick up what I taught you in this se segment? We have a midterm, we have a final. And the thing that surprised me the most is we also have with each lesson an associated discussion forum. So an online discussion forum. And I thought with 156,000 students, I'm gonna get killed in office hours. But it turns out that the people in the class answer each other's questions. And it makes a lot of sense because they're all in the same boat. I know this material, but they can explain it to each other in ways that make sense to them because they're newbies to this, see? And what's fascinating is that that giant class worked well. We had a bunch of people graduate. We ran it a few months later, and we had another 127,000 signups. So this is sort of a new paradigm for education, yeah. a new way of learning. I think that's right. I think it's right. With things like YouTube and things like the Khan Academy and MOOCs from us and from other places, you're seeing a kind of inversion of the normal order. People are learning at home, and they're going to class in order to actually have that conversation, which is difficult to do in a lecture setting. Mm -hmm. So it's the beginning of sort of what's called the flipped classroom, a different way of teaching. It's a lot cheaper than going to an expensive college, too. It sounds like it really yeah. could be revolutionary. Yeah, I think so. We're actually going to have to wrap because we're just about out of time, unfortunately, and we could talk about many more right. things. I'd like to thank my guest, Daniel Russell, sure. research scientist at Google, studying how people organize their information and search for it and putting it into Google products so it'll be even better and sort of an accelerating cycle. Dan, thanks a lot for being here. It's Pleasure interviewing you. Great, thank you. Thank you for watching. Be sure to tune in next time and visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman. See you next time. Hey, we have that. There we are.